He's the evangelical pastor of the Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California, which is the eighth largest church in America. He's the author of The Purpose Driven Life and The Daniel Plan. This is my take on Rick Warren's Words of Wisdom. And today we're going to look at the second essential skill. And it is this, knowing how to recognize what's important and what's not important. I can't tell you how important this skill is and how few people have it. To look at a situation, oh, that's important, that's not. That matters, that doesn't matter. That's valuable, that's not valuable. This is crucial, that's not crucial. Leaders know what's important. And they focus on that and they forget everything else. Successful people know what matters and don't worry about what doesn't matter. Paul says, this one thing I do, not these 40 things I dabble in. He is focused, he's laser focused. And you have to learn this skill in life to be successful at work and at, at home uh, and, and in life. The skill of knowing what matters most. Now, have you noticed that you don't have time to do everything. Yeah, of course you have. You have noticed this in life. The good news is this. God doesn't expect you to do everything. And there are only a few things in life worth doing in the first place. God hasn't called you to do everything in life. He's called you to do what he's called you to do, what you're gifted, what you're shaped. We're gonna talk about that in the future. And what's important in life. Knowing what matters most is extremely important. Look at this verse on the screen. 1 Corinthians six twelve says this. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. What does that mean? You're free to do anything with your life. God isn't gonna force you to do anything with your life. It's all permitted. You can waste your life, you can invest your life, you can spend your life. Everything's permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Some things in life are not necessarily wrong. They're not necessary. And oftentimes, we give first-class allegiance to second-class causes, and those causes betray us. I talked to one time to a guy who said, I climbed the ladder of success, and when I got to the top, it was leaning against the wrong wall. Not everything is worth doing. And so you can save yourself a lot of time, a lot of energy, if you learn the skill of knowing what's important and what's not important. Knowing what's valuable, what's not valuable. What matters and what doesn't matter. Selection is a key to success in life because you don't have time for everything. And selection, just like these other skills, is a skill that you can learn. The better you get at selection, and prioritizing what matters in your life and what doesn't matter, the more effective you're going to be as a person, as a partner, as a parent, as a leader in life. You know, I thought since uh, we were talking about prioritization, I would show you a screenshot uh, of the four folders on the top of my computer desktop. Can we put that picture up? This is my desktop. And there are actually four, four folders on my desktop. Number one is things God wants me to do. Number two is things people I love need me to do. Third is things I want to do. And four is things everybody else wants me to do. Which of those four do you think has the most? Number four. Which is the least important? Number four. And that's when people say, can you write an endorsement for this book? Can you do this for me? They're not even people I know a lot of times, but they want me to do something. You have to know, what does God want me to do? What do the people I love need me to do? What do I want to do? There's a legitimate part for that. And then what does everybody else want me to do? And God has not called you to fulfill everybody else's will for their life. Does that make sense? So what I want us to do this weekend is talk about how do you discover what matters and what doesn't matter? What's valuable and what's not valuable? What, what is important and what's not important? You see, every time you make a decision, what we're talking about here is clarifying your values. Every single time you make a decision, you are basing it on unspoken values. 
You have a grid in your mind. You've never even thought about this, most likely. But you have a set of values in your mind, and every time you make a decision, I'm gonna do this and not do that. I'm gonna buy this and not buy that. I'm gonna spend my time and effort and energy on this and not on that. You are showing your hidden values. The problem is most people have never figured out what they are, where they came from, and whether they're valid or not. So really the secret of success is clarifying your values. This is a skill you need to learn. What is valuable to me and what is not valuable? Every time you make a decision, you reveal your values. My question is, do you know where your values came from? Are they how are they working out? Is your life working out with those values? Uh, do you know where you picked them up? Are they working for you? Your values in life determine your stress, determine your success, and determine your salvation. You don't rationalize the failure. You don't make excuses for the failure. You grieve it. You feel the pain. You don't brush it off. You don't downplay it. You feel the pain, and you don't rush to feel better. Now, listen, this is a principle of life I'm about to tell you. To get past it, you gotta go through it. That's true in so many areas, but it's particularly true with failure. To get past your failure, that failure in your life, you gotta go through it. You can't go around your failure, you can't go over your failure, you can't go under your failure, you can't ignore your failure. You need to grieve the failure. You need to feel the pain. Now we don't like feeling bad, but grief is a good thing. Grief is the way we get through the failure and grief is the way we learn the lessons so often, we want to just, when we fail, we want to just forget it, push it aside, stuff our emotions, and then immediately go to the next thing. When you stuff your emotions, when you swallow your emotions, your stomach keeps score. It's kind of like, what if you took a can of Coke and you shook it up for a long time and then you put it in the freezer? What's going to happen to it? It's going to explode eventually. It's gonna come out sideways. And this happens in your life when you don't deal with your emotions properly. This is why sometimes six months after failure, a marriage falls apart. Or six months after somebody gets laid off work, there's another problem. There's a physical health problem, things like this. Because you've shaken up the can and you've got all these emotions feeling inside of shame and regret and fear and, and, and insecurity and all the things that come with failure and you're not dealing with them. And so you shake it up and you say, we're just gonna put this in the refrigerator and try to forget about it and we're gonna freeze it and it's gonna explode and it's gonna come out sideways in an affair or in uh, wrong behavior or an impulsivity or an addiction or all kinds of other things. I have seen this thousands of times in people's lives. You don't minimize it, you don't rush to feel better. To get past your failure, you've gotta go through the failure. God blesses those who are gentle. Look at that. God blesses those who are gentle. And then here's the promise. The whole earth will belong to them. Are you kidding me? That's about the most extravagant statement ever made. The whole earth will belong to anybody who's gentle. Do I really believe that? Well, I wouldn't, except Jesus said it. And Jesus doesn't lie. Jesus said, I am the truth. Not I have the truth, I teach the truth, I point the truth, I am the truth. So if Jesus says, God blesses those who are gentle, the whole earth will belong to them, guess what, I believe that. He's saying, somehow locked up in this third key of blessing is the key that when you learn what it really means to be gentle, the world's yours. I mean, it's your apple, it's, it's your, you're in charge. It's not driving you, you're driving it. Now. In our hard driving, ego driven, market driven culture, you don't hear a whole lot about gentleness. And the reason why is we don't understand what it really means to be gentle. We think gentleness means weakness. And God says, absolutely not. The gentle are the strongest people on the planet and the earth 
will be theirs. It's the weak people who are arrogant. It's the weak people who are prideful. It's the weak people who are pushy and rude and mean and gossip. Those are weak people. He said the truly strong people in life are the gentle and the world will be theirs. Now, I want you to write down a definition. This is not the first fill-in, so don't put it on that line. You're just going to have to write it somewhere else on the outline. But let me give you a true definition of gentleness. It's here on the screen. Gentleness is strength under control. Gentleness, the Bible teaches, real gentleness is not weakness, but rather it's strength under control. A gentle person does not overreact. A gentle person is not driven by their own emotions. A gentle person is not someone who just is so moody and anything can let him fly off the handle. A gentleman, gentleman person is strength under control. The, the Greek word in the Bible for gentleness is the word prates, prates. In the old translations of the Bible in English, it is translated as the word meek, meek. Now nobody uses that word anymore because meek has become a synonym for weak and gentleness or prates is anything but weak. In fact, the word prates or gentleness in the Bible was actually used to refer to a wild stallion that had been tamed. If you go out into the fields or in the hills and you find a, a, a wild stallion who's strong and unbridled and they have enormous strength and they could kick you and kill you pretty quickly, but if you bring that stallion back and you tame it, then the strength is brought under control. The strength is bottled up for the master's use, and now it's useful. A tamed horse is no less strong than a wild horse. It has just as much strength. It can go just as fast. But a tamed horse, a proud taste horse, a meek horse, a gentle horse, is one that it is strength under control, it is bottled up for the master's use. And when you learn true gentleness as a man of God, when you learn true gentleness as a woman of God, it doesn't mean you're weak, it doesn't mean you're a doormat, it doesn't mean uh, you're any of those things that you might think meekness or gentleness means. It means you're not overreacting. You're in control of your emotions and you have strength under control. Interesting. Your consciousness is the way you talk to yourself. Oh, good. Your consciousness is <laughs> the story you tell yourself. Yeah. Remember when I was talking earlier about autopilot? Yes. I can tell your autopilot. Finish this sentence 10 times. It's just like me to be. And I'll tell you your autopilot. It's just like me to be lazy. It's just like me to be late. It's just like me. That is your autopilot. Now, the story we tell ourselves it is the fourth factor that influences us. The Bible says as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So he is. And, and so you have to change your autopilot. Now let me tell you how to do this. All of us have things we want to change in our lives. The way you think affects the way you feel, and the way you feel affects the way you behave. If you want to change the way you act, you start back here with your thoughts. If, if I'm acting depressed, it's because I feel depressed. And if it's, I feel depressed, it's because I'm choosing to think depressed thoughts. You can't change a feeling, but you can change a thought. You tell a little kid, stop, be happy. I'm trying, daddy. <laughs> you can't force a feeling, okay? You can't force a feeling, but you can change the thought that is creating the feeling. Now, here's a real important thing about temptation, and I've shared this with a lot of people. It's helped a lot of people. When, we have a, when you have a habit, or I have a habit that I, I don't like, and I'm being tempted to go to this habit over and over and over, the key to changing a habit is not to resist it, but to replace it. Not to resist, but refocus. If a guy's having a problem with pornography and he's watching TV, he doesn't just say, no, I don't want this, I don't want this. He just flips the channel. The moment you change the channel, it, the, the temptation loses its power on you. Do not, listen, here's a pastor telling this, do not resist temptation. Do not resist temptation? Yeah. And let me tell you why. Says the pastor. Yeah, let me tell you why. What you resist persists. 
but because the whole time you're focused on it. What you need to do is just change your focus, and this is taking your conscious and saying, I'm going to renew my mind. I'm going to think on these things, whatsoever things are pure and lovely and of good report. I'm going to think about good things. And that's how be transformed by the renewing. By the renewing of your mind. Yes. It's not say, when I was a little kid, Oprah, my mom would bake chocolate chip cookies at night, and I'd walk and stand up at the, the kitchen table, and my mom would say, now, Ricky, don't, don't you eat those chocolate chip cookies because dinner's coming. And I said, I'm not, Mom. I'm just looking. <laughs> Whatever gets your attention gets you. Yes. So if you want to break a habit, you just refocus. And that's the renewing of your mind. Put your mind on the right thing. Instead of trying to resist the wrong thing. Don't try to resist. Because the whole thing, if I'm sitting there going, man, I really ought to stop smoking. <laughs> I really ought to stop smoking. Wow, I ought to stop. What am I, the whole time I'm focused on what I don't want. Yes, yes. Instead of what I do. And so that's a, a key thing in this fourth card of your consciousness is that you let the Lord renew your mind. And, you know, I tell my members all the time, you, you know, you're going to listen to the word or the world because the world tells you all kinds of stuff. The world says you're not competent, you're ugly, you don't matter, you're worthless. Don't listen to it. God says, you're valuable, you're capable, you're forgivable, you're usable. And, and, and so you listen to the right thing, not the wrong thing. Let me thing. just say this. No matter what you do, somebody's not going to like you. No matter, you cannot please everybody. You, you can't please everybody all the time or even part of the time. Uh, so here's the thing I would say to you. You don't need other people's approval to be happy. Now, that's an important thing. We think if I can just get everybody to love me, I'll be happy. No. First, you're never going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, like, some of you have been trying to get your parents' approval, and they're, like, dead, mm -hmm. or they're elderly. And you, if you haven't got it by now, you're not going to get it. But here's the thing. You don't need it. You don't need anybody else's approval to be happy. You need to live for an audience of one. Only one person matters. Only what's done for Christ will last, you know? And so uh, live your life for an audience of one. And when you do that, if you build your life on unshakable foundation of the purposes of God, they never change. To know him, to love him, to grow in him, to serve him, to share him. Those are the five purposes of life. Membership, maturity, ministry, mission, magnification. Give me a letter and I'll name it. C's or E's or Q's or R's or whatever. Uh, it's the same five purposes that you are called to be loved by God. That's knowing him. You're called uh, to belong to his family. You need to be a member of his church family. You're called to become like Christ. That's discipleship. Uh, you're called to bless others. That's ministry. And you're called to be sent. Jesus said, I send you into the world. That's your mission. When you build your life on stuff that never changes, then uh, you can experiment with all the other stuff. Mm. Uh, it, it gives you a lot of confidence because you're not building either your identity or your self-worth on, uh, on what somebody else's think. And if you focus on that, love God, God will bless you in the decisions you make. And even you go, well, that was a dumb decision. He could still use it. All things work together. Hey, if one of these really jumps out at you, go ahead and let me know in the comments down below. Just by you writing about it, you'll remember it. All right, enjoy.